LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Listen without limits. Unchain your brain. Change your thinking. Change your life. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is John Michael Greer who joins us to discuss his book, The Twilight of Pluto, Astrology and the Rise and Fall of Planetary Influences. Recent research in astrology has shown that the discovery of a new planet correlates with the emergence of a new set of influences in individual and collective life. As Greer reveals, the opposite is also true. The demotion of a planet correlates with the decline of a set of influences. Exploring the waxing and waning of planetary influences in astrology, Greer explains in detail how the demotion or proved non-existence of a planet marks the beginning of a roughly 30-year period in which that planet's influence fades out. He examines several examples of planet demotion, including Ceres, whose influence began to take shape some 30 years before its discovery in 1801 and gradually faded over the three decades following its demotion in the 1850s. Examining Pluto's astrological influence in depth, from the beginning of the search for Planet X in 1900 to the end of its influence in 2036, the author shows how during the Plutonian era, the concept of cosmos, from the ancient Greek meaning that which is beautifully ordered, was an eclipse. Pluto's influence led to the rejection of unity, beauty and order, exemplified through the splitting of the atom by physicists, the splitting of the individual into conscious and subconscious halves by psychoanalysts, and the splitting of the world into warring camps by politicians. Offering an essential guide not only to the astrology of the future, but also to the twilight of the Plutonian era, Greer shows how as Pluto's influence fades out in the years ahead, a great many disruptive phenomena of the recent past will fade with it. Hello and welcome, John, and thank you so much for joining us once again on LegalizeFreedom.com. Well, thank you for having me back on. It's always a pleasure. John, you're one of my uh, most frequent and longest running guests, uh, so I'm delighted to have you back once again. As I said, we're discussing your latest book entitled uh, Tw The Twilight of Pluto, Astrology and the Rise and Fall of Planetary Influences. Before we dive into that, as usual, just offer listeners a, a brief potted bio, as difficult as that might be. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, it's actually quite simple. I've, I've led a very quiet, um, I mean, ordinary life. I mean, I'm sure everyone does things like, um, you know, run a, an order of druids and things like that. At any rate, um, born and raised in the in the Seattle suburbs, um, in um, got interested in um, strange things as as an escape from suburban boredom. Um, I've been a very long time student of occultism and other esoteric traditions. I spent twelve twelve years as the head of the ancient order of druids in America, and um, other than that, you know, perfectly ordinary life on the fringes. Um, I live in Rhode Island these days with my wife Sarah and um, write lots of books. Now, I grew up being absolutely fascinated by astronomy, not astrology, because at that time, mm -hmm. all the astrology meant in my life was the little horoscope, you know, in, in the, the daily newspaper. Um, oh. Yeah, ex exactly, exactly. But as someone who was obsessed with, with the, the night sky and stars, and even, even when I was mm -hmm. very young, just pictures of space, mm -hmm. and later graduated in the 1980s to uh, the BBC, the you know, longest running show on the BBC called The Sky at Night, uh, and the astronomy mm. show, which, uh, Patrick Moore helmed for many years, Sir Patrick Moore. Uh, so uh, mm -hmm. all of this is building up to say that although the, and even the title of your book you, it has the word astrology, and we'll get into astrology stroke astronomy deeply and, and, and what these things are and what they are not mm -hmm. as we go through. But as someone gr who grew up, uh, fascinated by, the night sky. Your book really is a it is a feast, you know. So I hope we can get that across in our talk because there were just so many interesting 
facts and thoughts mm-hmm. and reflections. And also, as someone who's very interested in what astrology really is, um, you mm-hmm. know, which I discovered via, uh, well, in bits and pieces as, through the years, but particularly uh, mm-hmm. going through Richard Tarnas. Uh, mm-hmm. Cos- Cosmos mm-hmm. and Psyche uh, again. Cosmos and Psyche, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think I just want to congratulate you on, on like an, an, a, a brilliant synthesis well, and you. Uh, or you know a really really engaging diverging book. One of the things that I think may have made my book very appealing to you is simply that I also had that same sort of astronomical background. Um, my first view of Saturn through through my own telescope, um, I. I didn't quite make my own in the sense of grinding my own mirror or this kind of stuff. I bought a mirror from Edmund Scientific, but I put together a, a reflecting telescope, a, a three-incher, when I was when I was um, still it, not quite in my teens. And my first view of the rings of Saturn through that scope is one of the defining memories of my childhood. I was deeply in outer space. I read, um, of course, the we didn't we didn't have the benefit of Sir Patrick Moore's. Um, the, um, well, we had his books. We didn't have his BBC program, um, but I read I read a number of his books on astronomy and um, of course we had the National Geographic magazine which back in those days was still pretty good and had a lot of stuff of course the space program was a, was very much a going concern in those days and so I was very interested in in if you will the nuts and bolts of what was going on in the heavens interested in the night sky interested in in the nature of the cosmos and so I tried to put that and the history of astronomy which plays a very important role in my story into that book um, I think one of the problems with astrology these days is that too many astrologers spend all of their time sitting indoors, you know, looking at, at horoscopes printed on paper or projected on, on on a computer screen, and not enough time doing what the old astrologers did and getting out there under the night sky and just taking in what's happening up there. Yeah, exactly, and that's really what uh, why I called your book Synthesis um, because it's sort of bringing together these two worlds, uh, which are which are really one. Perhaps you could offer um, a sort of succinct uh, summing up of what astrology is and what it is not uh, for people who are maybe used to the you know the daily tabloid um, horoscope. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I know it's difficult to kind of just you know sum it up, but it would be I think it would be good at, at the opening just to to have something to offer listeners. Oh sure. Well, actually, I can do this very easy by talking about the distinction between astronomy and astrology because the two um, they they are. Um, very closely related. You, you can't have astrology without astronomy, but they're very much related the way that science is related to engineering. Um, astronomy tells you what's out there in the heavens. Astrology tells you what that means. Now, it is a matter of common um, dogma these days that the movements of the planets cannot be related to anything on Earth. That's one of our the basic dogmas of science these days. The problem is that it doesn't work that way. Um, more than 5,000 years ago, um, for a variety of complex cultural re- reasons, um, priests in the, the ancient societies of Mes- Mesopotamia started tracking the movements of the planets, um, the sun, the moon, and the five then known planets against the background of the stars. They were convinced that these beings were gods, and if they could understand their movements, that would, that would tell them what, what the gods had in mind. Now, you know, whether one happens to be into that kind of astrotheology or not, we can leave that aside to, you know, uh, worshippers of Bell and Marduk. But it so happens that they did this in, 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 in the classic scientific method. They recorded what happened. They recorded what happened in the sky. They recorded what happened on Earth. And they got to the point after, you know, after a few centuries, they were going, hold it, Mars. Of course, they had their own name for him. But um, Mars is doing this complex thing. The last 15 times that happened, there was a war. Um, I wonder if we're going to get, well, okay, the king's just declared war. Mark that one down on the clay tablets. That's how astrology came into being. And this is important to realize because astrology was did not start with theory. It started with experience. It started with people tabulating correlations between the heavens and the earth. So astrology is the result of that process, that 5,000-year process of people watching the heavens, comparing movements of the planets to events on Earth, and finding connections, finding correlations. Um, Do we know why it works? No. Uh, Try getting the necessary funding for for an appropriate study to find out. Um, Nobody's even really sure where to look. But the correlations are quite reliable. So, So to sum all this up, we can say that astrology is is the, the science of um, 
the correlations between planetary movement as observed from Earth and events on Earth. And it is still, it is still in its, really in its pre-theoretical stages. We don't know enough about the underlying processes to be able to set out a detailed theory as to what causes what. We're in the same position of students, the, the students of gravity were before Newton. Um, you know, well, actually, no, more before Einstein, because Einstein, with his theory of the curvature of space, actually had, this is why it worked. Newton was just saying, okay, this is what happened you know, 32 feet per second per second acceleration in a vacuum. Okay, we don't know why, but that happens. We're kind of there on astrology these days. The closest I've ever got to trying to communicate with, um, you know, interested lay people, uh, the concept of astrology and um, effects on the earth uh, or, you know, other heavenly bodies or, you know, human events has been the sort of kinetic idea of, um, you know, gravity and other forces. Uh, so mm -hmm. they'll, they'll think, oh, so, you know, that the, the moon has an effect on tides on the earth. Uh, therefore, mm -hmm. if I'm talking about the, you know, correlations between uh, the, the movements in the heavens and events on earth, it must mean kinetic push and pull and stuff like that. And I'm saying, no, no, that's not, that's not what it is. No, I think that that's that, that's very much you can see the influence of our culture there, the tendency that we have to think of everything in the cosmos as something shoving something else. Go on. Yeah, and so when you when you try to move beyond that, and you were talking about you know the early stages that we are at in trying to understand the mechanisms or, or forces. I know I'm using sort mm -hmm. of scientific terms there, but you know engineering that's terms um, at work here that it might turn out to be, um, if we ever discover anything about it, it might turn out to be one of those pesky effects that science likes to ignore down here on Earth, you know, things that can't be measured or tested or repeated, um, and they appear to be in, have some kind of non-material dimension to them. So it may, <laughs> it may turn out that, you know, if we ever learn anything uh, uh, what's behind w what we're calling astrology, that it may, mm -hmm. it, may just, it may just be something that isn't, um, you know, Newtonian and, and, and mechanistic. It may be, uh, mm -hmm. imagine it's connected somehow to the human mind. Well, then you're into that, that world, as I say, that science now likes, you know, the, the paranormal, supernatural, parapsychology, all of that. If it's anything, mm -hmm. if it touches upon any of those realms whatsoever, we're, we're going to encounter the same sort of difficulties in trying to get, um, the scientific community to, to consider it seriously. Oh. Oh, the scientific community is not going to consider it seriously, no matter what. One of the things that, uh, let's see, who was the guy? John McLennan, who was a sociologist, some years ago wrote a book called Deviant Science, where he was, he was talking about the way that scientists respond to parapsychology using the sociological theory of deviance. Now, theory of deviance sounds fun, I know. But what it amounts to is that every community defines itself by what it rejects. And if you... If you're in one of the outgroups and you try to get closer to the in to the in group, you try to cross that boundary, you cause status panic in the in the group that's trying to exclude you. They freak out, they push back, they raise the walls even higher. Whereas if you back off to the fringes, they mellow out. We saw a lot of this with parapsychology, and of course, this is what McLennan was talking about in the 1960s and 1970s. You had people who were researching um, parapsychology, they were researching ESP, they were researching telekinesis, and doing it scientifically and trying to get published in scientific journals, and the scientific community had a meltdown because they had defined these things as bad and wrong and superstitious. They belonged to the outgroup. That's your that's your your exclusion. That's your definition by what we're not. And so, as the parapsychologists tried to push toward science, the scientists got more and more stressed. They went to deeper and deeper into status panic because their entire definition of who they are is based on excluding things like parapsychology. Astrology is the same way. Um, Right now, here, here's the example. Right now, um, a lot of observatories around the world are having to struggle for funds. I mean, the Palomar Observatory here in the United States, with the biggest Earth-based telescope in the world, they're having to struggle to keep adequate funding. They could get more money than they know what to do with in a week. All they would have to do is start doing horoscopes. 
I've been told by astronomer friends of mine that um, they, they constantly field, astro astronomical observatories constantly field requests for horoscopes from people who aren't clear on the difference between astronomy and astrology. All they would have to do is just say, okay, we're hiring an astrologer to do this stuff. And, I mean, Palomar, they could, they could you know, market these expensive horoscopes to Hollywood stars complete with um, a deep space photo of the second of arc that was rising um, you know, at, at the moment of your birth. They'd make, they'd make serious money, but they won't. They won't even think of it. If you suggest it to them, and I have, I've done so, you will get a world-class hissy fit because astrology is what they define themselves against. We are not those people, therefore. <clears throat> so, you know, so, so science, science as such, science is currently constituted, is never going to pay attention to astrology. They can't, not without letting go of their own self, their own self-definition, not without, throw, as they see it, throwing open the gates to the Visigoths and the Vandals. Um, which is fine. The rest of those of us who are not part of that little, you know, community can make up our, our own minds and study on our own. So we have correlations between events mm -hmm. in the heavens, just to mm -hmm. use that word, and events mm -hmm. here on Earth and human affairs. Mm -hmm. So let's say a bit more about that it was sort of planetary discovery, you know, because this, the story of uh, astronomy is is one of, you know, pl of planetary discovery you know, and other ob objects and mm -hmm. the development mm -hmm. of civilization. So uh, quoting from uh, your book, you know, the, the discovery of a previously unknown planet should correlate fairly precisely in time to the emergence of a new set of influences on humanity's individual and collective existence. Uh, those newly mm -hmm. discovered planets, in turn, also mark the emergence of new forces in human life and thought. Now, that's that's mind blowing. Mm -hmm. A couple of sentences for anyone who hasn't come across this. So perhaps we could just expand the central idea a little bit more okay. and, and say something more about that. Okay, I want to start first of all by making sure that nobody misunderstands this, and most people misunderstand this. They think, okay, a scientist discovers a planet. That means that suddenly the heavens shift and this new influence. No. Scientists are as subject to, astro to astrological influences as everybody else. A planet is discovered when it's time for that planet to be discovered. Again, the basic theory of astrology is that there are these patterns in the universe that are simultaneously present in the heavens and on the earth. We are, you know, human beings have some agency, we have some ability to act freely, but it's not 100%. And the more collective phenomena, the more we're dealing with crowds and masses and communities and nations, the less wiggle room any individual has to, to shape it. The more it depends on these factors that we track by astrology, which we might as well call astrological forces. So, a planet is discovered when it's time for the planet to be discovered. When this new influence is, is burgeoning and about to burst into, in, into human awareness, somebody looks in the right place of the heavens. Um, you can you can call this synchronicity using Jung's term for it if you want, but that's certainly that's what happens. And one of the things that makes it most fascinating is that, and one of the things I talked about in my book is that you can see the the influences start to build before the planet is discovered. Very often, in several of the cases, about the time that the first search for the planet begins, about the time that people go. I wonder if there's a planet up there. N not in the case of Uranus, obviously nobody guessed that. But um, after that, um, yeah, there's this there's this period which is about one Saturn cycle, about thirty years, where this influence is building, interest in this possible new planet is building, astronomers are getting more and more excited. Is there a planet? Then they find the planet, and the new influence is in full flow. So we're talking about a vision of the universe in which human life is part of the cosmos. It's not separate. It's not this little individual thing uh, completely isolated from, from celestial influences, from, from other factors in the cosmos. It's part of a whole pattern that, that embraces and influences us all. Yes, when you're writing about, I mean, that's one of the most fascinating things in this, how there's some kind of like pre-effect, as it were. And um, when, you, mm -hmm. when you're writing about um, Uranus and yet, Neptune, that section of your book was when it's first mentioned to think that this effect begins prior to the, the observation. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like, it is almost like, um, how, you know, in synchronicity, how there's like, 
um, you see this sometimes in precognition and stuff, this idea like sort of presentiment mm-hmm. or a, a feeling of something mm-hmm. going to, going to happen, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you see this something even in the work of, uh, you know, Rupert Sheldrake, for example, you know, you think of a, oh, yeah. you, th- you think of a friend and then the phone rings and it's your friend on the phone, you know, that type of thing. Uh, <laughs> uh yeah. Yeah, so in fact, in fact, you know, people start thinking of a new planet, and then the new planet calls. Ring. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're another really fascinating dimension to all this is when you were writing about. Well, this is you know it runs throughout the book this thread, but when you're writing about series and other bodies, um, mm-hmm. you know, um, asteroids that they were going to you know, became their status changed, and how they were regarded, the status had an effect. Mm-hmm on their effect, as it mm-hmm. were. So, and this is really the mind-blowing thought in, in this point, is how we regard these celestial bodies, um, how we regard them affects how they affect us. So... You see, I'd say it the, I'd say it the other way around. It's how they affect us determines how we regard them. Okay, yeah. Well, when it, the four, when, yeah, but one way or another, there's a correlation mm-hmm. between the, the planetary effect and the planetary presence in human consciousness. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, when you switch that around, which actually it, um, does make sense, um, so I wonder why I said how we regard them. It was almost like, uh, but of course, you, what the pre- previous point I made about this pre-sentiment was like they're they're already there, waiting to be discovered. As it was, so that's that's why you turned it around, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Well, but but also. Also, there is one of the most deeply rooted um, presuppositions in the in the mindset of the modern Western world is the idea that human beings are that we are the sole possessors of agency. We are the ones who make things happen in the world, and everyone else, everything else in the cosmos, is just sort of passively sitting there waiting for us to do something with it. Now, of course, we all know, in, in a sort of in a sort of straightforward conscious sense, we all know that's not true, but. That's the presupposition that's hardwired into into our, into the way we think about the world. You know, the, um, the environment is just resources for us, or what have you. It's it's all part of that same pattern. And so, in the same way, to to actually grapple with the thought that the planet or the forces represented by the planet, let's say, that they were the active partner in this, that they were the ones who actually pushed things into motion, and the human beings were responding to them, not taking action and affecting them. That takes work. It's not easy for Western people to really get their minds around in any kind of deep way. And so, and it's one of the things that's come up in practically every time I've talked about these, about, about, the, about the Pluto book and about the ideas behind it. You know, that's one of the things that always has to be discussed is this presupposition of human agency. Yes, yeah, so it's a relatively modern way of thinking, isn't it? Last, Very much so. you know, last few hundred years, as you say, that we have. The- mm-hmm. Now, speaking about you know human agency and action, I was reminded reading through your book of uh, the idea of the consciousness in the planets and other heavenly bodies, uh, particularly mm-hmm. particularly in the sun. And I wanted to ask you about that concept because I remember a few years back reading Gregory Sam's Son of God. That's um, S-U-N mm-hmm. of God, where he speaks about mm-hmm. s- solar consciousness. And then there was a, a, mm-hmm. a recent uh, lecture that Rupert Sheldrake gave, actually, just simply titled, Is mm-hmm. the Sun Conscious? And to me, this mm-hmm. this makes a lot of sense. And although you don't uh, really particularly address this um, in your book, to mm-hmm. me, the idea, given that I've spent so many years thinking about consciousness as the, the ground of being and like consciousness per- potentially mm-hmm. permeating everything, or, uh, or mm-hmm. everything being within consciousness, this concept mm-hmm. made a lot of sense to me, and it really resonated mm-hmm. when I was thinking about, um, uh, you know, the idea of the 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 correlation between events, you know, with mm-hmm. the w- wider solar system and uh, human mm-hmm. human mm-hmm. human affairs and events on Earth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, the thing is, th- this this is a very ancient, very widespread set of beliefs, and it's one that a lot of people still have today. Um, I mean, the ancient Greeks, the people who invented logic, came to the conclusion that the planets were conscious beings. That was the, you know, in the the sort of last centuries of, of the Greek philosophical tradition, everyone more or less agreed that the that you know these these huge these huge beings, these huge complex presences in the heavens, um, needed to be understood not as lumps of stuff, but as 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 beings, as entities. 
course, they gave them the, the names of their gods. Um, and of course, that's that's also true of the Earth, both in their view and in a lot of other views. It's it's something I consider to be the case, for example, and that that you know it is it is another of the superstitions of of modern scientific thought that um, only human beings can be fully conscious that uh, you know animals well kind of sort of but we're going to we'll, we'll more or less pretend in the case of pets but um, and but but even just grappling with the consciousness of a plant. It is is a real stretch for many people. Most of the traditions of philosophy and of wisdom in the world have always held that all things are conscious, each in their own way. And if that's true of everything we encounter on Earth, it should certainly be equally true of everything we encounter in the heavens. And so it it really does make a difference, of course, if you're thinking of of space as this vast vacuum with lumps of stuff in it, um, which you hopefully are going to conquer for mankind or some such drivel. Um, bef- and then you think of it as a community. You think of it as this this vast network of conscious beings, far vaster than we can even imagine, that are perhaps all communicating with each other, and all communicating with the vast planetary being on which you know we live our lives, like you know, um, like the bacteria currently living on your toenails. <laughs> um, we are to the earth what those bacteria are, are to us. And um, I think it's a relevant viewpoint. I don't know how you would test it, but equally, I don't know how you would test the claim that there is no consciousness in the sun. I, I really don't know if there's any if there's any way to prove it one way or the other with our limited access to information and with the limits of our minds. So, you know, since it cannot be known one way or another, maybe we should be the, take the more generous option and assume as a, as a working supposition that the sun is a conscious being. The sun is the solar logos, as he was called in, in a, lot of, a lot of the old spiritual traditions, and that maybe we should treat the earth as conscious being and maybe we should be a, treat the universe as a community of conscious beings. It really does help. There's a film that listeners might be interested to check out um, entitled Sunshine. And uh, the basic mm-hmm. basic plot summary, uh, so like spoiler alert, if, if you want to just, you know, mute at this point and check it out later, uh, is that they, uh, in a future Earth, you know, the sun is dying and the, the Earth is beginning to freeze over and obviously humans are suffering in this like growing basically the equivalent of some kind of nuclear winter. It's getting colder and colder. Life's getting tougher and tougher. So a mission is dispatched out uh, towards the sun, the idea being uh, be essentially to, to launch nuclear weapons into the heart of the sun and fire the whole thing up again. Uh, now, the first mm-hmm. mission the first mission goes silent. They're not heard from. So a second mission is dispatched in order to try and discover what's happened. And that's the mission that we follow in the movie. And when they arrive and find you know the original ship and they board it, they basically discover that the first mission has come, oh, everybody's been wiped out apart from what they discover eventually is one person. And the original mission mm-hmm. has uh, technically not been able to achieve what they set out to achieve, but they've come into contact uh, with what the one remaining member, who's a gibbering, um, you know, insane lunatic, refers to, I have, you know, I have conversed with God. They, they've come into contact with some kind of impossibly immense form of consciousness beyond any comprehension um, of the human mm-hmm. mind and it's just destroyed them physically and psychologically so yeah just just a movie recommendation which uh, touches upon <laughs> some of those days but basically saying that not only uh, is this uh, you know, other bodies as well in the solar system of course in the galaxy and the mm-hmm. wider cosmos but mm-hmm. the sun is very much conscious and actually in, in a way that mm-hmm. um, if we we, we, we we can't even begin to approach begin to conceive of and you know people talk about god in mm-hmm. those terms as well so it's, it's an interesting mm-hmm. it's an interesting uh, cinematic diversion that concludes part one of our interview part two will be available soon in the subscribers area at legalizefreedom.com legalizefreedom.com <laughs>